I just got out of my car and I'm in a pretty interesting location. It's mostly a parking lot, although there are some buildings. The 64 freeway is right nearby, as is Skyline Drive, which goes northeast of here into Shenandoah National Park, and the Blue Ridge Parkway, which goes southwest. This is the Rockfish Gap, an important junction in the middle of the Blue Ridge Mountains, not only as it relates to roadways and getting around, but also because underneath the soil, in fact, in this unkempt patch of trees, bushes, and tall grass, lies what little remains of the mountaintop tavern. It was here a little more than 200 years ago that Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and other dignitaries chose Charlottesville as the site of the future University of Virginia. You're listening to Mountaintop History, a podcast dedicated to telling the story of Monticello and all who lived and labored at this plantation. I'm Kyle Charlton. Thomas Jefferson believed that education was essential for a flourishing democracy, that knowledge was power and one of the greatest pursuits in one's life. His belief in the power of knowledge would ultimately lead to a lifetime political and personal project to bring public education to the state of Virginia. In the 1770s, Jefferson authored three bills for the Virginia General Assembly, one revising the curriculum of the College of William and Mary, one creating a public library, and another titled, A Bill for the More General Diffusion of Knowledge. The preamble of this bill sounds strikingly similar to the preamble of the Declaration of Independence. Whereas it appeareth that however certain forms of government are better calculated than others to protect individuals in the free exercise of their natural rights, and are at the same time themselves better guarded against degeneracy, yet experience hath shown that even under the best forms those entrusted with power have in time and by slow operations perverted it into tyranny, and it is believed that the most effectual means of preventing this would be to illuminate, as far as practicable, the minds of the people at large. Jefferson's plans for public education in Virginia would hit a number of roadblocks. In the meantime, his ideas continued to develop. He believed, for example, that the College of William and Mary, his alma mater, should be replaced by, quote, more centrally for the state, a university on a plan so broad and liberal and modern as to be worth patronizing with the public support and be a temptation to the youth of other states to come and drink of the cup of knowledge and fraternize with us. It was only during Jefferson's retirement years that his plans for a public university would take shape. The year 1817 proved to be pivotal. Jefferson and a number of dignitaries met in Rockfish Gap at the Mountaintop Tavern to decide on a location for the new university and ultimately chose Charlottesville. Land for the university was purchased from James Monroe and in October of that same year, the cornerstone of UVA's Pavilion 7 was laid down. Jefferson took great care in designing almost every facet of the university, from the architecture and curriculum to the composition of the faculty. He called the university the hobby of my old age and considered his project an example for the future of education in the United States. This institution, he wrote in 1820, will be based on the illimitable freedom of the human mind. For here we are not afraid to follow truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error so long as reason is left free to combat it. Many individuals associated with the Monticello Plantation, both free and enslaved, worked toward the construction of the university. 
including Burl Colbert and Thrimston Hearn. Others, such as Dorothea and Lucy Cottrell, became the property of UVA's professors. These facts point out a stark reminder that the University of Virginia was not envisioned for all residents of the state. In fact, it wouldn't be until 1950 that UVA's first black student, Gregory Swanson, would enroll after the university was forced to desegregate. And in 1969, Ginger Scott became the first woman to enroll in UVA's College of Arts and Sciences. But even Jefferson found that UVA would not meet his own expectations. He would only live to see a single year of his university with enrolled students, including one Edgar Allan Poe. And a number of these students took to drinking, gambling, and other vicious irregularities, as Jefferson called it. The University of Virginia, however, was one of his proudest accomplishments. He considered it so great to his own legacy that he left behind a wish, that on his grave it be inscribed that he was, quote, father of the University of Virginia. This has been another edition of Mountaintop History a collaboration between WTJU and the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. Mountaintop History is also supported by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. To learn more and to plan your next visit, go to monticello.org.